Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. Today, we have the pleasure of uh, conversing with Larry Haas, the author of a fascinating new book on the Kennedy brothers in the world, addressing their global statecraft across uh, several decades, three careers of three exceptional uh, Americans. Uh, Lawrence Haas is a foreign affairs analyst and commentator, now a historian. So Larry, thank you so much for joining this conversation. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Mark. It's hard to think of more, another set of brothers who have had more impact on American foreign policy, maybe the Dulles brothers. So the, the three Kennedys, uh, Jack, Robert, and Teddy are exceptional in that regard. So what uh, draws them together in terms of uh, their foreign policy perspective? Well, first of all, you know, it starts in the very early days of their lives as their parents, Joe and Rose, are tutoring them and encouraging them not just to attain power, uh, but to look beyond America's borders, to learn about the world, care about the world, and once they attain power, to shape America's role in the world, and through that, to change the world itself. In terms of what ties them, them together over the course of more than 60 years uh, in public office, um, they uh, believed in American leadership, uh, that America needed to step up, uh, discard its traditional isolationism, and lead the free world to promote freedom and democracy. Um, they believed heavily in American engagement, uh, America engaging not just with traditional powers, but with the new, you know, new emerging nations across the developing world in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, they uh, all, uh, you know, uh, feared war, favored diplomacy, uh, and uh, wanted to control uh, the world's deadliest weapons. Um, so they wanted a strong but secure America, and they pursued that for over the course of more than six decades in public life. Now, as you address, uh, their father, uh, Joseph's public career effectively was ended by his close association with Neville Chamberlain and the policies of appeasement while he was uh, ambassador to Great Britain. And it's uh, easy to jump to the conclusion that his sons were uh, internationalists in reaction against the father's mistakes. But the story is actually more complicated than that, isn't it? It really is. I don't think that they became internationalists uh, as a reflection of uh, youthful rebellion. I think actually what happened was that uh, the parents, and Joe in particular, uh, sent uh, each of the sons overseas to learn about the world. And uh, to his great credit, uh, he didn't tell them what to believe. He just told them, learn about the world and make up your own mind. And they, uh, by themselves, came to the conclusion after traveling to the far corners of the world that America could not sit back, that the challenges were too great, that if it was going to defend itself and defend its interests, uh, it needed to discard isolationism. And Joe never tried to talk them out of that. He argued with them. In fact, uh, interestingly, he continued to promote isolationism while they were public figures and they were promoting something quite different. But, uh, but again, to his great credit, he did not tell them what to believe. He encouraged them to make up their own minds and all three of them made up their own minds in, in a way that was uh, dramatically different uh, than what he thought over the course of his career. Now, famously, Jack Kennedy was uh, America's uh, first Catholic president. Mm -hmm. Each of the brothers was raised as a uh, a Catholic, especially by their devout mother. Uh, to what extent did their Catholicism shape their viewpoint towards issues of war and peace and America's role in the world? Well, um, they were all fierce anti-communists. They all really understood the difference between a free and democratic uh, society and an unfree communist or otherwise authoritarian society. They had a very strong sense of right and wrong. And I do believe that that um, is a reflection of their Catholic roots, uh, their teachings as to, you know, what's a good life, 
um, as opposed to a bad life? What's the virtuous life? And the virtuous life to them was a life um, of attainment uh, in a free society, uh, a society in which people can pursue their own interests. Uh, Bobby, uh, interestingly, uh, is the one who has the strongest sense of right and wrong. In fact, he sees foreign policy like he sees everything else in terms of black and white and good and evil. And I don't think that it is a coincidence that among the three brothers, he in fact is the most devout, the most like his mother in terms of uh, you know, attachment to Catholicism. He was an altar boy when he was uh, a, a boy. Um, he attended mass regularly throughout his adult life. And uh, he married Ethel uh, Skakel, who was even more devout than, than he was. Um, but I, I do think that you see uh, Catholicism in the general approach to foreign policy in all three of the brothers. Now, uh, the Kennedy family was very close to uh, Senator Joe McCarthy and of the brothers, I believe uh, uh, RFK was uh, the closest. And uh, I think Joe McCarthy attended uh, the weddings of two of the three brothers. Uh, JFK seemed uh, less inclined to want to align with McCarthy. How did the Kennedys uh, navigate their relationship with Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism and all that that represented? Well, somewhat awkwardly, frankly, um, you know, there's politics involved. He was, in fact, a close family friend. And uh, the Kennedys, as I mentioned earlier, you know, all were fierce anti-communists uh, with the emergence of the Soviet Union. So, you know, their initial reaction to the rise of McCarthyism was that Joe McCarthy was serving a quite worthwhile public purpose in rooting out communists in government. And Jack um, defended him. Uh, at moments when he was uh, under attack. Uh, Bobby worked for him uh, as a Senate staffer on the investigation subcommittee when McCarthy was at the height of his power. Uh, when you see McCarthy fall, uh, Jack and Bobby kind of handle it awkwardly. Jack is in a hospital bed, so he has a very good excuse, but in fact, he was not there for the Senate vote to censor. Uh, Joe McCarthy, um, when, you know, the political winds changed and the feeling was that he had gone too far. Uh, Bobby, um, you know, kept his human attachment to Joe McCarthy, even after he left, uh, you know, due to uh, the fact that he was disagreeing with where McCarthy was going. And, you know, very quietly, um, he attended uh, Joe McCarthy's uh, funeral. Uh, in 1957. Interestingly enough, Joe McCarthy was not just uh, a family friend and somebody who attended, as you mentioned, uh, some Kennedy weddings, but um, Joe McCarthy was the godfather to Bobby and Ethel's uh, first child, uh, uh, Kathleen, uh, who is now Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Um, so McCarthy did, you know, was involved in the Kennedy life over the course of quite a number of years. JFK and RFK visited uh, Indochina when it was still under right. French colonialism in the 1950s, and that certainly had a profound impact on how they would come to view uh, Vietnam. Of course, uh, President Diem was assassinated during Jack Kennedy's uh, presidency, and uh, RFK's uh, rise in 1968 was a reaction to LBJ's failures right. in Vietnam. How did the Kennedys overall uh, view the war in Vietnam, and would JFK have administered that war differently than J LBJ? Well, in the 1950s, uh, Jack in particular, uh, uh, although supported by Bobby, thought that Diem was a, uh, um, a good partner for the United States. He was a strong leader. He seemed to be presiding over a society in a way that uh, people you know, felt like they were free and uh, prosperous. Um, so he went into Vietnam only with military advisors and to make a stand against Soviet expansionism somewhere in the world, uh, because he felt that he needed to do that and Vietnam was as good a place as any, but he only came in with military advisors. They peaked at 18,000 
And over the course of his presidency, uh, Jack, uh, and again, uh, as um, you know, also reflected in Bobby's evolution, um, lost faith in Diem. Uh, over time, Diem became more removed from uh, his population, his constituency, uh, more autocratic, uh, cracked down much more on uh, human rights over the course of time. And with regard to where they were headed, uh, I think it's quite clear that Jack planned to withdraw from Vietnam after his presumed re-election in 1964. He told Defense Secretary Bob McNamara to plan for withdrawal over the course of 1965. He told Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield of his plans. He told other White House officials of his plans. He withdrew 1,000 military advisors from, from its peak level uh, before his assassination. And uh, he was speaking quite openly uh, about his growing disenchantment with Diem and the growing challenges of the South winning that war under its current leadership. So all everything to me adds up to a withdrawal. And needless to say, um, American history would be much different if Jack had lived, had won re-election, and had pursued that withdrawal. Just think about how, how different life in America would be today. We would not have had, you know, years of internal strife, uh, 500,000 troops in Vietnam, uh, growing cynicism about American government and, and all the rest. So it is really a tragedy in so many ways that Jack was assassinated in 63. And then, of course, Bobby uh, being assassinated in 68 because he was possibly, not certainly, but possibly on the road to uh, uh, the Democratic nomination. We would have had another Kennedy-Nixon um, race. Uh, Bobby might have won that race, and certainly uh, he would have prosecuted the war much differently, uh, you know, beginning in 1969 than Richard Nixon did. Nixon eventually got us out of Vietnam, but boy, it took a whole number of years, and Bobby would have, certainly would have been speedier about it had he been elected. The most uh, decisive role that the Kennedys played on the world stage was uh, almost certainly the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, right. Bobby was uh, Jack's uh, closest counselor during those days, and managed uh, that crisis was managed successfully, perhaps owing to Jack's uh, very cool, detached uh, rationality. But uh, presumably, uh, Bobby also deserves a great deal of credit. Oh, they both absolutely do. Um, Jack showed real courage throughout that period by, um, you know, withstanding the uh, overwhelming desire on the part of his military advisors to launch a military strike to wipe out the weapons, perhaps accompanied by a land invasion to uh, topple uh, Castro. Uh, Jack. Uh, distrusted the military in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, where they promised that um, they'd be able to topple, that the exiles who would invade would topple Castro, and we'd have a non-communist regime there without too much trouble. Um, that happened in, in April of 61, uh, and he never fully trusted the, his military advisors after that. So he decided to appeal to Khrushchev as a fellow politician rather than the madman that some of the people around Jack were suggesting that he was. And he leaned on Bobby more than anyone else to help him negotiate. And it was Bobby who goes to see, uh, you know, Soviet, uh, top Soviet official uh, uh, Dobrynin in a meeting uh, towards the end of the crisis in which they cut this deal uh, where uh, the United States agrees uh, in exchange for the Soviets removing their missiles from Cuba that the United States quietly would remove its missiles from Turkey on the Soviet border. Uh, but he basically says to Dobrynin, we'll do this quietly, but there can be no public mention of this because we cannot be seen giving this kind of a concession. Uh, but I assure you that this will happen. To the great credit of Khrushchev, he says nothing about this. He accepts the deal, and the United States does, in fact, follow through 
uh, in three or four months time and quietly removes the missile. So it's quite an achievement in statecraft by Jack as assisted by his most trusted advisor, who is in fact his brother. Now, Jack, uh, of course, uh, was uh, the great grandson of uh, Irish Catholic uh, immigrants, uh, but he also was a Bostonian, went to Harvard and imbued much of that uh, New England Brahmin way of thinking. And uh, how he spoke about America very much was in sync with traditional uh, American civil religion. I believe he may have been the first major public figure who used the phrase, uh, a city on a hill, hearkening mm -hmm. back to the now famous uh, Puritan sermon. Uh, so Jack almost seemed to have, um, at least how he spoke, how sincere it was, I don't know, but uh, a mystical view of America as a, a special uh, democracy with a, a providential role in the world. Oh, I do believe he was not, he may have been the first leader, as you say, to hearken back to the City on a Hill sermon uh, of the Puritan era, but he was not the first president to believe that America was a providential, special uh, place in the world and had special responsibility. Uh, but he, oh, I absolutely believe that he, he felt it in his bones that America was a special place, that it needed to serve as a moral beacon for uh, you know, political dissidents, would-be Democrats all over the world, um, and that we had a special responsibility uh, to promote freedom and democracy, that there were hundreds of millions of people all over the world uh, who were struggling, uh, teeming masses who were you know, hoping for better lives, and uh, we were the free alternative to the communist way. And we needed to take that seriously and play our role. So yes, um, I share your view that Jack thought of America as a special place. And I think his foreign policy in holding firm and promoting freedom and democracy at some very challenging times was a reflection of, of what he felt in his bones about America. I recall that uh, Jack's, uh, his favorite, or one of his favorite books was a biography of uh, British, Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Lord Melbourne. Are there any particular um, major historical figures that were especially influential on Jack and the other brothers? Oh, certainly for Jack, it was Winston Churchill. Um, he used to quote Churchill. He listened to Churchill's speeches in terms of learning how to speak uh, with dramatic effect. Um, he used Churchillian language when he talked about um, the challenges uh, facing uh, America. If you listen to Jack, um, and it was 1947 or 51 or 56 or 59, um, you really got the sense that it was Great Britain in 1940. Um, he always spoke in that kind, in those kind of dramatic terms about the challenges facing. Uh, free and democratic governments, just the way Churchill spoke to rally the British people at some very uh, dire moments. Um, in terms of uh, others, uh, you know, they all had their favorites. I mean, uh, you know, Ted, who uh, played a larger role than, than any other American figure over the course of decades to help bring peace to Northern Ireland, um, became quite enchanted with... Uh, Irish figures, uh, poets, writers, leaders, um, uh, and Bobby. Uh, Bobby was very taken by Greek mythology. He uh, read the, uh, the Greek masters over time. He quoted them uh, quite a bit. You know, all three of uh, these brothers were terribly learned figures. Uh, when I went back and researched and, you know, not just learned about how they were raised, but read their writings, their books, their articles, uh, devoured many of their speeches. Boy, they were rich intellectuals who were more than happy to quote historians, uh, leaders, poets, um, uh, and other great figures uh, of the past. So each of them um, had their favorites and, uh, and, and you see that when you listen to them uh, talk over the course of time. 
And finally, of course, the Kennedys were known as uh, cold warriors in the 1950s, but the last brother by the 1970s and through the 1980s was much more uh, dovish and sometimes is accused of, uh, in some ways, undermining the Reagan administration in his visit to Moscow and meetings with uh, Soviet leaders. So how do you explain that transition for Teddy? And was there actually a continuity there or did, he, did his opinions on the Soviet Union shift across the decades? Well, um, I will say that all three of the brothers, as you mentioned, are hardcore cold warriors through Jack's death. Uh, Bobby and Ted actually both evolve, and it's largely because of Vietnam. Uh, they are no less anti-communist. They did not lose their real hatred of communist ideology and, con and you know, commu communist-type governments um, all, all the way till the end of their dying days, whether that's Bobby in 68 or Ted all the way in 2009. Um, but um, because of Vietnam uh, and with the rise of China, they come to believe, uh, number one, uh, that America you know, needs to be careful when it flexes its muscles uh, and uses military power. So they become much more distrustful of that. And, you know, the world is evolving. China is emerging. And they're looking for ways to live uh, with these communist governments, even if they don't trust them. Uh, now, we, you mentioned uh, Ted going to Moscow, which he did more than once. Uh, there was actually more coordination with Republican uh, presidents uh, over the years than, than has been suggested. Uh, uh, when Ted went to Moscow for two trips um, in the 1970s, uh, the White House was fully involved in both cases, once under uh, Nixon and the second time I believe under Carter, and he returns in the 1980s and actually works in very close concert with uh, the Reagan administration in terms of sizing up the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, and sending messages from Reagan um, to Gorbachev, setting the stage for the meetings that Reagan eventually would have and the arms control deals and the freeing of political dissidents that follow uh, Ted Kennedy's visit. So he's not out there on a, uh, as a lone ranger. He is quite cognizant that he's, uh, you know, an American figure uh, and that he needs to work in concert with whoever the president of that time happens to be. And finally, Larry, uh, could you hold up a copy of the book? Yes, I'd be delighted to do so. So uh, this is, in fact, uh, the book. And uh, that picture on the cover, which is not one that people see very often, is from 1962. Jack is president, Bobby is attorney general, Ted in the middle, uh, that year runs for the Senate for the first time. You see, interestingly, Bobby's wearing glasses, which is uh, something that you don't always see. Um, it is not clear what they're discussing, but based on Jack's overwhelming interest in foreign affairs, it would not surprise me if they were mulling whatever the foreign policy challenge of that day happened to be. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak about it. Um, here's the book, and I hope people will check it out. Lawrence Haas, author of uh, The Kennedys in the World, thank you very much for a very insightful conversation. Well, thanks for having me, Mark.